Today, we're going to wrap up square roots with graphing. We'll talk about domain and range and solving equations with square roots. Let's take a look at the graph of y equals square root of x. When I pick values and make a table, what you want to pick for x is perfect squares. The first one we can plug in is 0, because the square root of 0 makes y 0. The next perfect square we can work with is 1, because 1 times 1 is 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. Then we can plug in 4. That's the next perfect square. Square root of 4 is 2. Then 9. The square root of 9 is 3. When we graph these, 0, 0, 1, 1, 4, 2, 9, 3, we can see the general shape of the graph. Keep in mind, there are numbers between all of these decimals that when I take a square root, I get a decimal. But just these values give us a good picture of what the graph would look like. It actually looks like a parabola, half of a parabola, turned on its side. When we talk about domain, remember what domain is. It's the x values you can plug in. Domain is x. And when we look at the x values, we see that they're all positive. That's because I can't take the square root of a negative value. Square root of negative 1 doesn't have a real answer. So there's no way we can take the square root of a negative, which means, look at the x-axis, x can never be negative. We know then that x has got to be greater than or equal to 0. can be equal to 0 because the square root of 0 is 0. The range is the set of all y values. That's the values you get out of the equation. It's all of these values right here. What do we know about y? Look at the graph. We see that y cannot be negative. There are no y's down here. Because when I take the square root of a number, I always end up with a positive value, or 0. All my y's, then, are on this side of the y-axis. They're all greater than or equal to 0. If I'm given an equation like y equals the square root of x minus 3, and I'm asked about the domain, then all I need to do is look at the square root part, because I can't take the square root of a negative number. It doesn't work, which means x minus 3 in this case can't be negative. It's got to be greater than or equal to 0. This whole thing has to be greater than or equal to 0. Remember how you solve an inequality. Just like an equation, you add 3 to both sides, and we get x is greater than or equal to 3. If I plug any value greater than or equal to 3, it'll work in this equation. Think about that. y equals the square root of x minus 3. If I pick 3 because it's equal to 3, y would be the square root of 3 minus 3, which would be the square root of 0, which would be 0. And if I pick any value greater than 3, like 4, y would be equal to the square root, I'm plugging in 4, 4 minus 3, which is the square root of 1, which is 1. As long as my values are greater than 3, I get an answer that will work in this equation. If you're given a more complex equation, it really makes no difference. This number doesn't matter. This number doesn't matter. What matters is that you can't take the square root of a negative number and get a real answer. So you take the square root part of the equation only. Ignore the rest you know that that square root has to be greater than or equal to 0, or it doesn't work. To get your domain, then, you just take the square root part, negative 3x plus 4, and set it equal to or greater than 0, and you solve. 
You subtract 4 from both sides. Negative 3x is greater than or equal to negative 4. And then you divide by negative 3. Uh-oh. You divided by a negative. You got to remember something about inequalities. If you divide or multiply by a negative and change the signs in a question, you have to flip that inequality. This becomes x is less than or equal to positive 4 thirds. When you divide by a negative, you have to flip the inequality. This is the domain. Again, notice the 6 did not matter. The 7 did not matter. All that mattered was the square root because it's got to be greater than or equal to 0. The last thing we're going to look at on today's assignment is how to solve equations that have square roots. We solve equations with the inverse operation. Remember that the inverse of adding is subtracting. Subtracting is adding. The inverse of divide is multiply. The inverse of multiply is divide. The question here is, what is the inverse of a square root? It turns out to be a square. What you do is square both sides. Now, root x times root x, that's what you have right here when you square it, and 7 times 7 over here, is the square root of x squared, and that's 49. The square root of a square is the number itself. The square root of x squared is x, because x times x is x squared. Notice over here, the square root of 6 squared, 6 squared is 36, is 6. The square root of 8 squared, that's the square root of 64, that's 8. The square root of 10 squared is the square root of 100, which is 10. Notice how a square and a square root, they're inverses of each other. They, in effect, cancel each other out. That means the square root of x squared is x. So this becomes x equals, and I take the square root of both sides. What you do to one side, you must do to the other. Square root of 49 is 7. And that's my answer. The problem you run into when solving with square roots is that to square, it's better if the square root is by itself. Take a look at this question. Notice what happens if I try to square both sides as it is right now. This becomes the square root of x plus 3 times the square root of x plus 3 when I square it, which means you'd have to FOIL. You'd have to take root x to both and then take the 3 to both, and you would be no closer to finding the answer than you were when you began. It would be a lot worse, in fact. What you need to do is get that square root by itself. Take a 3 off each side. That means the square root of x equals 6. Now you can square both sides without a problem. The square and the square root, they're inverses of each other. I'm left with x. And 6 squared is 36. My answer is 36. With a more complicated question, like the one in red, the goal here would be to get the square root by itself. I need this by itself. Solve this like an equation. The last thing you do is divide by 7. You first need to add 4 to both sides. 7 times the square root of x plus 2 is equal to 14. Now, you heard me say it, there's times there. Divide both sides by 7. Cancel. The square root of x plus 2 is equal to 2. I can now square both sides because the square root's by itself. The square and the square root cancel out. I'm left with x plus 2 equals 2 squared is 2 times 2, 4. I can take a 2 off each side to see that my answer is x equal 2. Keep in mind, that means if I plug x equal 2 into the original question, it should make a true statement. Plug in 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. 2 times 7 is 14. And 14 minus 4 is 10. I know for absolutely sure that 2 is the correct answer.
The rest of this video is questions from your assignment. Question 1. Let's graph the square root of x. We did that in the teaching. Remember what you want to do is pick perfect squares for x. 0 works because the square root of 0 is 0. I'm plugging in 0 in the square root. 1 works because the square root of 1 is 1. 4 works because the square root of 4 is 2. And 9 would be 3, because the square root of 9 is 3. That's not on my graph, though. I'll plot 0, 0, 1, 1, and 4, 2. And in WAMAP, you only need two points to graph it. You click on those two points and graph your square root function. For question two, the same thing is true. Pick perfect squares. Square root of zero is zero. And zero minus five would be negative five. Plug in one. When I put in the square root of one, it's one. And one minus five would be negative four. Uh, my next number, my next perfect square would be 4. And when I put in 4, it becomes a square root of 4, which is 2. 2 minus 5, which is negative 3. Let's plot those values. 0, negative 5 is right here. 1, negative 4. And 4, negative 3. Notice it's exactly the same graph. It's just moved down 5. Question three is a little trickier to find values to plug in because you need to make perfect squares. Zero is a perfect square, and what you need to do is pick an x that makes zero. Notice that if I plug in negative two, negative two plus two is zero, and the square root of zero is zero. My next value I'd like to create would be one because I can take the square root of one. Which value of x do I plug in that creates 1? That would be negative 1. Because if I plug in negative 1 for x, then negative 1 plus 2 is 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. The next perfect square I'd like to plug in is 4. But I need to find an x value that creates 4. Notice that if I put in 2, 2 plus 2 is 4, and the square root of 4 is 2. Plugging in 2 for x creates 4, which is a perfect square. The square root of 4 is 2. Let's graph these values. Negative 2, 0. Negative 1, 1. And 2, 2. Again, notice it's exactly the same graph. It's just move left 2. Question five, we're going to find the domain of this function. We know a square root can't be negative. That means that this thing, x minus two, whatever that is, has got to be greater than or equal to zero. Solve that, add two to both sides, just like an equation. x is greater than or equal to two. Reminder, you only flip this sign if you divide or multiply both sides by a negative. You don't do that if you add or subtract, or even if you multiply. You've got to multiply or divide by a negative number. So this is our answer, but what equation do we solve? It's right there, and that would be this one. Let's find the domain of this function. The square root can't be negative. That means that x plus 6 has got to be greater than or equal to 0, because it can't be a negative number. Take a 6 off each side, and x is going to have to be greater than or equal to negative 6 to work in this equation. For question 10, again, we're looking for the domain. We know the square root can't be negative. That means 4x plus 17 has got to be greater than or equal to 0. We'll take a 17 off each side. 4x is greater than or equal to negative 17. And I'll divide by 4. Do not flip the sign. 
you only flip the sign if you divide or multiply by a negative number. That would have to be a negative number. We don't flip the sign here. X is greater than or equal to negative 17 fourths. Question 12. We can't take the square root of a negative number. Just because you see negatives there doesn't mean the number it creates would be negative. You've got to find those numbers. What numbers do you plug in that would make that negative? You know that negative 5x minus 25, that thing under the root, when I plug in x, this has got to create a positive number, or 0. It's got to be greater than or equal to 0. We'll add 25 to both sides. And negative 5x is greater than or equal to 25. Then we'll divide both sides by negative 5. Hey, it happened. I divided both sides by a negative, which means I have to flip the sign. Greater than or equal to becomes less than or equal to, and that would be negative 5. As long as I choose values that are less than or equal to negative 5, they will work in this equation. Question 13. First thing we're asked for here is the domain. We know that x minus 4 has got to be greater than or equal to 0. Add 4 to both sides. That tells us that x has got to be greater than or equal to 4. Now we're going to plug these values in. This is a calculator exercise, and we're going to round to two places if we need to. Round to the hundredth. Remember that f of x is just y. You can replace it with y whenever you feel like it. y here will equal the square root of x minus 4. That's 19 minus 4. That's the square root of 15. And I put that in the calculator. And to the nearest hundredth, I got 3.87. For the next one, we're going to plug in 15. Y will equal the square root of 15 minus 4, which is the square root of 11. And the square root of 11 is 3.32, rounded to the hundredth. For the next one, it'll be Y equal the square root of 6 minus 4. That's the square root of 2. And the square root of 2 is about 1.41. And for the last one, it'll be y equal the square root of 7 minus 4, which is the square root of 3. And the square root of 3 is about 1.73. Question 16 is a quick one. The square root of t equals 5. We're going to solve for t. To get rid of a square root, we square both sides. The square root and the square cancel out because this becomes the square root of t squared equals 25. And the square root of t squared is t, so t is 25. Question 18. In order to square this and solve for x, we have to get the square root by itself. Here's the problem. If we just tried to square both sides as it is, this would become the square root of x minus 3 times the square root of x minus 3, which means I would have to FOIL it. I'd have to take root x to both and then take negative 3 to both. That would create a horrible situation and wouldn't get me any closer to the answer. Basically, you can't get rid of the square root until the root is by itself. There can't be any addition or subtraction anyway. If I go back to this equation and just add 3 to both sides, I get 2 is equal to the square root of x. Now that that square root's by itself, I can square both sides. The square and the square root cancel out, and I get x. And 2 squared is 2 times 2 is 4. The answer is 4. Question 20. The square root is by itself. As it is, I can just square both sides. 
The square and the square root cancel out, and I'm left with t plus 6 equals 10 squared. 10 times 10, that's 100. Take a 6 off each side, and t would be equal to 94. Question 22. We again have the problem where the square root is not by itself. The first thing you need to do is take a 7 off each side. Because the last thing I'll do to get the square root by itself is divide by 7. It's just like when I solve for a variable. If I had 63 equals 7x plus 7, I would first take 7 off each side, and I would get 56 equals 7x, and then I can divide by 7 and get that x by itself. That's exactly what I'm going to do over here. Subtract 7 from each side, and I'm left with 56 equals 7 times the square root of x plus 5. Since this is multiplication, I'm going to divide both sides by 7 and cancel. 56 divided by 7 is 8. The 7's canceled on the other side. We're left with x plus 5. Now I've got the square root by itself. I can square both sides. The square and the square root cancel out. That leaves me with 64 equals x plus 5. And I can take a 5 off each side, and I get x equals 59. Notice that I can plug in 59 and check and see that it works. 63 equals 7 times the square root. Let's plug in that 59 plus 5, and then outside of that, a plus 7. That's 63 equals 7 times the square root of 64 plus 7. That's 63 equals 7 times 8 plus 7. That means that 63 is equal to 56 plus 7. And 56 plus 7 is 63. I can see it makes the equation true. 59 is the answer. For question 24, remember my advice is to get the square root by itself. That's because when you have addition, like the square root of x plus 3 equals 10, and you try to square both sides, you have to write this one out twice and foil it. And that is a horrible situation. Foiling that doesn't get you anywhere. But this question is different. The reason it's different is that if I square both sides as it is, see the multiplication there? I don't have to FOIL. I just need to square both of these. This is 9, and when I square the square root of t, the square root and the square cancel out, so it's 9 times t equals, and here the square and the square root cancel out, so I get 6t plus 6. 9t equals 6t plus 6. We can take 6t off each side and get the variables on one side. That's 3t equals 6. And divide by 3, and I get t equals 2. If you're wondering whether you got the answer correct or not, you can always go back to the original question and plug in 2. Notice that if I plug in 2, here I get 3 root 2. On the other side, I get 6 times 2 plus 6. That's 3 root 2 equals 12 plus 6. That's the square root of 18. The square root of 18 is 9 times 2 which the square root of 9 goes out front as a 3, which is 3 root 2. So what I have here, then, is 3 root 2 equals 3 root 2. I can see that it works. The correct answer is t equal 2.